And tell us, why is there so much concern today about biological warfare and terrorism? Colonel Parker. Well, Doris, the threat of biological warfare has increased, but, but just as importantly, our appreciation and understanding of our vulnerabilities has become sharpened. When the Biological Weapons Convention was signed in 1972, it was thought that we only had a few countries out there that were developing a BW capability. Well, the Gulf War was a wake-up call for us, and we learned a great deal about who and how biological weapons might be employed against us or against our allies. And our, and our concept for use and our defense doctrine was, was based upon a battlefield uh, scenario and a battlefield threat. We now, now know that there's many more countries working on biological capability, and we know that several of those countries are also supporters of international ter terrorism. So the, B the BW threat is serious, and the battlefield may indeed be right on our own soil in the form of bioterrorism. All right. Mr. Blitzer, how does the FBI view the threat? Well, just echoing what Jerry mentioned, uh, for us, we've seen a change in climate over about the last 10 years. Just look at the kind of cases we've seen. Pan Am 103, World Trade Center, Cobar Towers, and, and the bombings uh, recently in Africa. This is different. This is uh, large uh, casualties, and, and it's of great concern. And let's face it, uh, with the, uh, the taboo being broken in Japan by the Am Shinrikyo, uh, it's happened. It's actually happened. Now, that was, that was come, but uh, it's not far away. You know, Doris, I think for the people out there in the studio, uh, it's useful for me uh, to think of this threat on three levels. So I like to think of the bio uh, threat on a strategic level, a tactical level, and a terrorist level. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at the strategic level, here I mean what would the enemy, and let's pick on the Soviet Union since they're not around anymore, what would the Soviet four-star general think makes a good weapon? His job is to win the war, to mm -hmm. alter the course of global politics. And what would help him do that? Well, if you look at it that way, the news is actually pretty good because there are very few weapon systems that have the downwind drift and the widespread uh, applicability to make them viable strategic weapons. And I think Dr. Bailey mentioned all of those. Uh, there's smallpox, there's plague, uh, there's anthrax, but very little else would make a viable strategic weapon. And we're not there yet, but it's entirely possible that with a little bit of research, we might come up with effective medical countermeasures for everything on that very short list. Now, when you switch gears and you talk about tactical weapons, what do I mean here? Well, here I mean what would the Soviet lieutenant colonel think makes a good weapon? His job is to take that hill this week. What would help him do that? Well, again, the news here is still pretty good. Now the list gets a little bit longer. Some of the toxins might now be included. But still, there are only seven or eight agents that would be viable tactical weapons. And again, with some work, we might come up with effective medical countermeasures for everything on that very short list. I'm here to tell you, though, and I'm sure Mr. Blitzer would agree with me, that when you start talking about terrorism, the task gets much, much tougher. Uh, because literally anything might make a good terrorist weapon. I think you have to ask yourself, what's the average terrorist after? And often the answer to that question is publicity. And if that's all I'm after, virtually anything uh, will get me what I want. And, and for a great example of that, uh, let's look at the Benai Brith incident. And for those of you who don't remember this, uh, in April of 1997, a postal worker uh, at the Benai Brith headquarters in downtown Washington, D.C., uh, came upon a package in the mailroom. And this package was dripping red liquid, and he opened the package, and inside was a, a blood auger plate, a Petri dish, uh, and written on there was the word anthrax, misspelled, but anthrax mm -hmm. nonetheless. Uh, and he did exactly what he was supposed to do. He pushed the correct panic buttons. He called uh, the FBI. Uh, they came down, retrieved the sample, uh, and tested it for the presence of anthrax. Well, uh, in the midst of all this, many other agencies got involved. Basically, a decon station got set up on Massachusetts Avenue. They quarantined the building. Uh, they took 100 people inside that building, stripped them down to their underwear, paraded them through decon in full view of the CNN cameras. And um, I have very mixed feelings for how things went that day. Uh, on the one hand, I think it was overkill. Um, I think that you could have tested that. Uh, again, biological weapons have something that other weapons don't have. They have incubation periods. In the case of anthrax, that incubation period would have been at least 24 hours. You would have had 24 hours to figure out what was going on. Well, as it turns out, um, there was nothing on that plate. There were no pathogens at all. And yet, here's a terrorist who got everything he ever could have hoped for. He shut down the nation's capital of the United States of America at rush hour on a Friday with an empty dish. And if he could do that with nothing, imagine what you could do with anything. I'm and that's, sure that's really an important example, I think, Ted, because and here, here was the first, I think, major test of 
the first response to something like this in the United States, and it was somewhat confused, to say the least. But from that, I think we learned some lessons. These hoaxes can be very serious for us, and, and we spend an awful lot of time on them. And unfortunately, we're getting more and more hoaxes every year, and it's resource intensive for law enforcement and the fire community. And uh, uh, we have to treat every single one of them as if it's the real thing, because you know, God knows when it will be the real thing. Colonel hmm. Parker, is this increasing the concern that a serious biological incident could occur? Well, the simple answer to that is, is yes, but let me explain a little bit. There's a growing concern that there's going to be uh, increased proliferation of, of weapons of mass destruction uh, to include biological pathogens and associated uh, delivery technology uh, to a dispersed uh, biological agent. As an example, the former Soviet Union had a, had a large uh, offensive biological program. Today, there's thousands uh, of scientists, engineers, and technicians who are either out of work or have not been paid for a long time. They have families to feed, and they simply could be tempted uh, to sell their knowledge and expertise to, to the highest bidder, whoever that may be. Uh, when you couple that with the fact that there seems to be a, an increasing trend amongst terrorists to uh, inflict uh, uh, indiscriminate killing on a larger scale, well then, yes, uh, we just simply have higher odds that a serious biological attack could occur and could come from either a regional aggressor, uh, a rogue third world nation, terrorist group, or even a religious cult. Mm. Is this an, um, I'm, I'm sorry, do you think that a terrorist would use a biological agent? Well, that's a Mr. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think they would. It, it's a simple answer, but let's face it, uh, just looking around at the kinds of cases we've had, uh, uh, the, the, the trend is mass, casual, mass casualties, as Jerry mentioned. And uh, what better uh, way to do it, frankly, and uh, uh, particularly in a bio, which is so insidious, because by the time they do it, they're gone, and you have an incubation period, and by the time you actually know it's happened, it's too late. That's right. I think if you asked me, uh, you know, what's the chance that somebody in Ottumwa, Iowa, will successfully use anthrax as a weapon this year, I'd say the chances of that are pretty slim. But if you ask me what are the chances that somebody, somewhere, will use something uh, in the next decade, I think the chances are almost 100%. And I think uh, Colonel Parker and Mr. Blitzer would probably agree with me. I agree. Well, Mr. Blitzer, what has the FBI been saying lately? Well, we've seen a, a tremendous upsurge in the number of cases around the nation, and it's really of concern to me because we, we began a couple of years ago with maybe 20, 30 cases a year, and now we're seeing an excess of 100 cases a year, and, and I think that's significant because uh, we are actually arresting and convicting people. Now, granted, these are basically lone actors, but it's out there, and uh, I've not seen it before. And in the whole scheme of things, I think it's an important trend, and we're following it very closely. Right. I think a great example of this trend is the case of uh, Mr. Larry Wayne Harris. And I'm sure many of the audience members are probably familiar uh, with Mr. Harris's case. You'll remember that he was the gentleman uh, arrested earlier in 1998 uh, with uh, anthrax in his trunk. And as it turns out, it was a, a veterinary vaccine strain, a harmless strain, but certainly uh, it instituted a Chinese fire drill, consumed a lot of the FBI's mm -hmm. resources, et cetera, et cetera. You'll also remember he was the same gentleman who in 1995 was arrested with plague in his glove compartment. And again, just a lone actor like this can certainly consume a lot of government resources. And, and you know, the thing about that case was that, it, that as we tested it, we kept getting hits for live uh, anthrax. So it wasn't until the definitive tests were done some 30, 40 hours after the event that we actually knew we had a vaccine. How is the internet uh, interacting in this? Yeah, I mean, it's out there. Yeah. I mean, it's all out there. If you, uh, if you look around the internet, not only do you see uh, stuff for bio, you see it for chem, arsons. It's, it's just a, a panoply of information on the internet that just makes things really easy for people. All right. Uh, Colonel Parker, why is it so difficult to control biological weapons proliferation? I mean, can't we just use treaties and agreements like we've done for nuclear and chemical weapons? Well, I wish we could, but it's not that simple. Uh, biological treaties have, have proven to be just very, very difficult to en enforce. In fact, most of the, treaty, the treaties have not had just the enforcement teeth. But it really comes down to uh, uh, biological pathogens can be produced very easily. And the same equipment that's, uh, need, uh, that's needed to produce a biological pathogen for nefarious use has legitimate research, medical, and other applications. 
So that dual use nature makes it very uh, difficult to gauge uh, the intent uh, of the bad guys, so to speak. And so it's that dual use uh, equipment that that's very, makes it very easy to hide illicit activities. And that can go on even on a national scale as we now know Iraq, the former Soviet Union, had very large uh, offensive biological capabilities, and it goes simply undetected. Mm. That's, you know, a great example of this phenomenon uh, concerns this explosion of microbreweries that's occurring in the United States. And Russian inspectors uh, come to our country for various reasons, and they're very concerned uh, about this explosion of microbreweries, because each and every one of these breweries could, with very little work, uh, actually be turned into a viable biological weapons uh, production facility. Well, Ted, is an, it is an example of, of that just last week I was in Russia and uh, uh, one day for lunch we went to a microbrewery for, for lunch but took a, a tour of the uh, brewery afterwards and the story is told to us uh, that the, the engineers from the, the biological laboratory that we had visited just the day before actually uh, it designed and installed the uh, fermentation equipment in this microbrewery. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that dual use uh, nature can go both, both ways and it's also uh, dual use is also personnel. Right. How do you keep up with what private citizens do? I mean, where do you draw the line between what's okay and what's illegal? That's really a great question. You know, we live in a free country and uh, people have First Amendment rights and, and we have to protect those. And at the same time, we have to be very vigilant uh, whenever we see criminal activity arising. Um, the interesting thing about some of the statutes that we have on the books is that it's not illegal to possess some of this stuff. Uh, for example, the Harris case was not illegal for him to uh, possess the plague. It wasn't illegal for him to possess anthrax. And Congress right, has recognized this. And we're trying to amend the statutes to make it uh, much more difficult for someone for, for nefarious purposes to have in their possession these kinds of substances. So how do we deal with the problem, or is it just too hard to do? Well, it's a very serious problem, and it's uh, got a lot of challenges uh, in front of us to deal with this problem. But we cannot afford to say this is too hard to do, nor can we afford to bury our head in the sand. There's many things that we can do. Just today, what we're doing today, educating uh, everyone, uh, and, and we can begin to put biological uh, pathogens on our list of differential diagnosis will go a long way uh, so that we can uh, recognize and make rapid diagnosis in case uh, an, an incident or an attack does, uh, does occur. We have to do much more in the, the medical R&D role, developing the appropriate drugs and vaccines that will be needed to, uh, to mount an appropriate uh, medical response. And with that, uh, if an attack ever were to occur, it's going to take a, a lot of agencies uh, to, to deal with an incident. It's going to have law enforcement. It's going to have national security implications. But first and foremost, the responsibility for dealing with the, uh, the initial consequences for saving life is going to fall in the medical and the public health communities. That's right, Doris. You know, Colonel Parker tells me that my job at USAMRIT is to assist in the development of product strategies mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, uh, countermeasures to assist in, uh, in safeguarding us against these 15 or 20 infectious disease agents that our intelligence communities perceive as viable biological warfare threats. And uh, in that context, we work on vaccinations, we work on uh, discovering new antibiotics, et cetera. We've come a long way. We've made great strides in uh, uh, trying to help our country defend against these agents. But right now, uh, we're still several years away uh, when it comes to developing vaccines against a lot of these agents. So in 1998, one of the big cornerstones uh, of defense is education, mm -hmm. is getting the word out, is raising the sense of clinical acumen uh, and the diagnostic capabilities of the medical providers out there. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with this course. And you know, for the last two years, we've worked awfully hard in our agency to try and prepare the domestic home front for this. And uh, the defense has had a a good program ongoing, teaching first responders the basics. And at the same time, uh, both the White House and the Congress recognize that there has to be a lot of work done, particularly in the public health arena, and to strengthen our public health uh, system throughout the country. Because let's face it, they're, they're our first line of defense when it comes to biological. And certainly, they're our second line of defense when it comes to uh, chem. And the public, the, the, uh, the health community just uh, plays such an incredibly important role in this whole arena. Well, I agree, Bob. But I think there's, uh, we can, uh, all that's uh, worked in this community can take a lot of pride in just the, the accomplishments that uh, have occurred over the last uh, couple of years. So, but uh, the journey has just begun, and there's a lot more work to be, uh, to be done, particularly in the public health and medical communities. Right. 
Ted, with all the good defensive steps we've made, why would anyone choose uh, to use a biological weapon anyway? Well, Doris, uh, there are a lot of reasons why a terrorist uh, might choose a biological weapon, but your question is a very good one. Uh, certainly, history is full of examples of how terrorists can achieve their aims uh, with conventional weapons. And Kobar Towers, World Trade Center, Oklahoma City, recent embassy bombings in Africa, all great examples of terrorists somewhat successfully employing conventional weapons. And furthermore, the gang at the Aum Shinrikyo in the Tokyo subway certainly has demonstrated uh, that terrorists can somewhat successfully use chemical weapons as well. So again, given that conventional and chemical weapons are readily available to terrorists, it's a good question. Why would a terrorist choose uh, to, to use a biological weapon? Well, uh, the first reason I can probably come up with is uh, these agents are incredibly easy uh, to produce. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone with two semesters of microbiology training can go out into their garden, dig up a handful of dirt, and readily culture themselves uh, Clostridium botulinum, the agent that causes botulism. In many areas of the world, uh, you could do the same thing with anthrax. Do you have a garden? Uh, used to. Okay. Um, the, the second reason I, I could come up with is that these things are inexpensive uh, to produce. Uh, and a study was done in 1970, and so this is $1970. I think you can probably triple the figures to put them into $1998. But they looked at uh, what it would take for a terrorist to produce mass casualties. And they defined that as 50% casualties over a one square kilometer area. And to do that with um, conventional weapons probably would have cost in the range of $2,000. To do that with nuclear weapons uh, would have cost about $800. Now, it costs more than $800, of course, to build a nuke, right. uh, but you get more than one square kilometer worth of bang for your buck. Mm -hmm. uh, if you wanted to do that like the Tokyo subway gang did uh, with sarin, it would have cost $600. And if you wanted to do that with anthrax, uh, it would have cost a buck. So I think it's not too difficult to see why a poorly funded terrorist group might look uh, longingly, I guess you could say, uh, at biological warfare. Uh, the third uh, reason I might come up with for why a terrorist would choose a biological weapon is these things can often be disseminated uh, at great distances. And I think we have a video clip here that demonstrates uh, this somewhat. And this video clip uh, used Venezuelan equine encephalitis as the putative agent, but this would actually apply to any one of a number of agents. And uh, they assumed ideal meteorologic conditions, proper time of day, and an airline releasing a line source 100 kilometers long south of Washington, D.C. And you can see here uh, that this agent cloud would affect not only Washington, mm -hmm. but Baltimore, Philadelphia, and regions as far north as Manhattan and New York City itself. So these things, again, can be disseminated at great distances. The fourth reason I might offer uh, as to why a terrorist would choose a biological weapon is that these things are odorless, colorless, tasteless, less filling. Uh, and what I mean by that uh, is when I teach defense courses, I often do so in conjunction with people from the Institute of Chemical Defense at Aberdeen. And the chemical uh, people will tell you that if you're bopping along the battlefield and this green hazy cloud floats by and it smells like horseradish or geraniums or whatever it smells like, that you should duck or mm -hmm. get out of the way or put your mop gear on or whatever. And I fully agree with that. That's exactly what you should do. Um, that's not going to happen with biological warfare, though. You are, chances are, you are not going to know what hit you. You're not going to see a green hazy cloud. You're not going to hear anything. You're not going to feel anything. Uh, it's going to be invisible and undetectable. Um, the fifth reason I would offer you is that detection is difficult. Now, we alluded already, I think, to these rapid diagnostic tickets, and we'll talk a lot more about those as the course goes on. And those are great. Those are a big step forward from where we were several years ago. But in order for me to employ a rapid diagnostic test, as was done in the Larry Wayne Harris case, et cetera, um, I need to know that I've been hit with something in the first place, or at least I need to suspect it. I've got to have the suspicion that something's going on before I know enough to pull these out of my pocket and start using them. And I'm here to tell you that if you even suspect bioterrorism, you've gone a long way towards winning the battle. The tough, tough part of this whole bioterrorism, biowarfare business is suspecting it in the first place. But where we're lacking is in standoff detection. And again, we're making great strides, but we're not there yet to where we have standoff detectors and we can go about our business confident in the knowledge that some alarm's going to go off if we're ever hit with a biological agent. The sixth reason I was offer, would offer is that the first sign that you are uh, hit, that you have been hit, 
uh, by a bioterrorist agent. I feel sick. You, you <laughs> <laughs> we'll get our diagnostic tickets <laughs> in there. But the, the first sign that you're likely to have uh, is uh, that there are human cases walking into mm -hmm. emergency rooms. So for you docs and nurses and clinicians out there, you're not likely to hear bombs bursting in air. You're not likely to see green hazy clouds out there uh, over your battlefields or your cities. What's likely to happen is a patient comes into your uh, treatment facility and he's got flu-like symptoms. And this is a big, big problem for us as medical practitioners because the time to treat a lot of these diseases is in the incubation period before people are actually ill. For example, if I blew anthrax into this studio and I started us all on ciprofloxacin right now, we'd all survive. We'd all mm -hmm. live happily ever after. But if I blew anthrax into this studio and I waited until we had the first early signs, the first little bit of runny nose, headache, little bit of fever, and then I started us on ciprofloxacin, many of us would die. So the time to treat anthrax is before you get sick. That's true of anthrax, it's true of smallpox, it's true of plague, mm -hmm. uh, it's true of botulism, it's true of many of the diseases that we're going to cover uh, in this course. So a big, big problem for us as practitioners. Uh, the seventh reason I would offer is that uh, BW is the gift that keeps on giving. And what I mean by that is some of the agents that we're going to talk about in this course are contagious. Now, most of them are not, uh, but a few are. Smallpox is, uh, pneumonic plague is. So if I'm a battlefield commander, uh, contagiousness is possibly not what I want in a weapon because I want to maintain control of the battlefield. Mm -hmm. If I throw a contagious agent out there, it goes on to affect uh, civilian population, etc. I've kind of lost control of the battlefield uh, in a sense. But if I'm a terrorist who doesn't care Fair. what he unleashes on humanity, then perhaps this contagiousness uh, aspect of these weapons actually looks attractive. I can unleash my weapon and it can continue to generate headlines, do dirty work, produce casualties, etc., etc. Okay. The eighth reason I would offer is that uh, sometimes a terrorist doesn't even need to use these weapons to achieve his aims. And the Benai Brith incident right. was a good example of that. These things have brand name recognition. So if you can convince the authorities, the national command authorities, that you're the first guy on your block to have Ebola, you don't even need to have Ebola. Sometimes just the threat of having it is enough to affect policy decisions at the highest levels. So you don't even have to spell it right either. That's right, don't have to spell <laughs> it right either. But the ninth reason uh, I might offer um, is that uh, perpetrators could protect themselves pretty easily uh, against these weapons. For example, if I decided I wanted to use a chemical agent uh, against some important government building, it would look pretty suspicious if I were sneaking around the building with a spray tank dressed in full mop gear. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if I wanted to use a bioagent, I could very surreptitiously vaccinate myself or start myself on antibiotics and be pretty pretty well protected uh, as I go around with my little spray tank uh, in the ventilating systems, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and the tenth and final reason that I would offer, and we'll cut it off here in the interest of time, is that the perpetrators can often escape before the effects of these weapon systems are felt. Remember, biological weapons have a very important characteristic that chemical, conventional, and nuclear weapons don't have, and that's an incubation period. And for most of these weapons, this is certainly variable, but for most of these weapons, that incubation period is 24 hours or greater. Well, in 24 hours, in this day of jet travel, I can be anywhere in the world. Uh, so I can unleash my weapon, and I can be safely back in Baghdad or Tripoli or Damascus or anywhere I want to be before anyone knows what hit them. So all of those reasons together, I think, uh, should help you understand why a terrorist might. I okay. want to choose a biological weapon. Well, based on this laundry list, Colonel Parker, I mean, it sounds so easy. So why aren't the terrorists reaching for it left and right? Well, a biological weapon is much more than just a pathogenic organism that uh, uh, is, easy, is easy to grow and produce and uh, relatively inexpensive. A biological weapon is actually consists of a system to include a pathogenic organism, which is readily available and, and inexpensive to grow and so forth. But it also it consists of a uh, munition, a delivery device, and a dispersal device. And to uh, have that technology available that can be efficiently disseminated uh, while maintaining the virulence of, of the organism and be disseminated in that one to five micron respirable aerosol size does require a, a great deal of sophistication. Not that it's impossible to do, it's, it certainly is possible to do, but it would require a level of sophistication that then your garden uh, uh, garage uh, uh, crazy. It's like I've been in the garden. <laughs> and uh, so it, it does require some sophistication and resources to, to cause uh, widespread distribution. Yeah, and I'll just, uh, just to mention that uh, there's, there's a great book called The Cult at the End of the World by David Kaplan. 
And he did, really did a, a, a really intense study of the Am Shinrikyo. And uh, they actually tried to disseminate bile. And uh, what really happened is there was so much pressure put on them by law enforcement that they just weren't ready yet. They, they had the technology, had, they had the scientists, they had it, but they couldn't get it done. So it's there. And, and a lot of these, a lot of these, uh, this information that we know about either the limitations, whether it be uh, delivery uh, uh, limitations, or also the advantages of biological agents. We actually know a great deal from, uh, from the former U.S. offensive program. You may or may not know that the U.S. had an offensive program that was disbanded by presidential directive in 1969 uh, by President uh, Nixon. So by studying that, studying the data in there, we've actually been able to uh, understand quite a bit about limitations and advantages, and that helps guide us as far as our defense. Okay. Well, I'm convinced that the threat of biowarfare and terrorism is real and that we really should learn something about it in order to better protect ourselves and for medical personnel to better care for their patients. Uh, before we go into some specific agents and what to do about them, uh, we should discuss some basics of how these agents are distributed and how people are put at risk. We have a video interview with someone who worked in the old offensive biological warfare program who describes to us some of the physical attributes of biological agents. So why don't we take a look at that tape now? Today I consider one of the greatest threats to the security of the United States is the use of biological warfare by terrorists, particularly state-supported terrorism. Uh, I've been all over the country uh, giving lectures and I uh, have several uh, items that I use as visual aids uh, to portray uh, what a biological warfare looks like, biological warfare agent looks like. Uh, initially, I used just one visual aid, a simulant Bacillus glabigii powder that resembles very much uh, Bacillus anthracis, the causative agent of anthrax. Now, in going through airport security uh, stations, I've never been stopped. I don't know exactly what uh, heroin looks like, but I would suspect it looks very much like this powder here. Uh, as time evolved, I've expanded my, uh, my, my visual aids, and I now have a lot more samples of what uh, various BW agents look like. Uh, this could pass for a VEE virus. It's a dry powder of eggs that have been taken through the same process uh, as uh, an infected egg. Uh, notice that this material is pink. Uh, it's because we harvest only the embryo in preparing a VEE virus. Uh, have several li li liquids here. This represents liquid Bacillus glabigii. I hope you can see that this material is thickened over time uh, and that it would be very difficult to disseminate because of increases in viscosity, uh, increases in particulates uh, due to coagulation. This is a sample of liquid VEE virus. Again, it's undergone deterioration and you, perhaps you can see the particulates uh, as they fall as I tilt the bottle. Now, in determining what a terrorist will use as a BW agent, uh, you must consider this fact, and that is liquid agents are easy to prepare, but they are very difficult to disseminate in the small particle aerosol that's needed for, a, uh, uh, for an, uh, an infection. On the other hand, dry powders are very difficult to prepare. The processes are much more complex, but they can be disseminated very readily into the 1 to 5 micron particle size. I'd like to demonstrate the fact that BW terrorists can, can manufacture liquids very readily, but in manufacturing a liquid, although the process is simple, it requires a great deal of energy on, in order to develop an aerosol composed of small particles. The easiest way of disseminating a BW agent although it's not very effective, is the use of a single fluid nozzle. Illustrated as follows. You notice as a spray, the, the, it's creating an aerosol for a very short period of time, but the aerosol quickly falls out of, uh, out of the air because of large particle size and becomes not very effective in terms of giving you an infection. Single fluid nozzle. A terrorist can then evolve into what we refer to as a double fluid nozzle, a two fluid nozzle. Now this material is much smaller as you, dis as you disseminate it. I hope you can see that this aerosol is remaining aloft much for a much longer period of time. 
But again, even a two-fluid nozzle with the amount of energy that I can generate by pushing this plunger is not very effective. You're, you're probably getting only about 1% of your total number of organisms airborne in the right particle size. On the other hand, terrorists, particularly state-supported terrorists, can use small powders, small particle powders, that can, be dim that can be disseminated very easily, as demonstrated by this simple garden sprayer for rose powder, rose uh, insecticides. Now, I've carried all these visual aids across many, many airports, and I've passed security without ever being asked, what is this material? Uh, what is this device? It illustrates one point, I think, very dramatically, and that is our air, air, support, air security points look for devices that go bang, your knives, your pistols, and what have you, but they have not been clued in to what constitutes a BW agent, what it looks like, and how it's disseminated. Now, state-supported terrorists can bring into this country through diplomatic pouch any number of bad actors like tularemia or anthrax, Today, I'm carrying about 200 grams of a material that could very easily pass for uh, tularemia, dry tularemia. Uh, this amount of material would cause 50% infections in a building as large as the World Trade Center. It can be derived from as few as 500 blood agar plates and then dried. So you see, it does not take very much material of a BW agent to cover a very large area and infect a very large uh, population of people. There are two major ways of distributing a BW aerosol. Each has its own unique advantages and disadvantages. The first method is referred to as line source dissemination. That is, a vehicle, a plane, a person, distributes the aerosol perpendicular to the wind, and the wind then transports the aerosol downwind. This is the most effective way of creating large target coverage, because you see you're using the energy of the wind to distribute the aerosol. The problem with uh, aerosols that, that are generated as line sources is that they are very, very sensitive to meteorological conditions. You must always have an inversion or a near type of inversion in order for that aerosol to go downwind. Now, inversions occur primarily early in the morning, or late in the afternoon, or at night. So therefore, biological warfare is a type of warfare that must be planned in adva advance. The second way of, of distributing an aerosol of a BW agent is by point source means. That is, you release large numbers of little bomblets that perhaps are about three inches in diameter, and you saturate the target. The advantage to point source release is that you can overcome, to some extent, bad meteorological conditions or unfavorable meteorological conditions. The drawback to point source munition dis distribution is the fact that the bomblet never distributes all of the material from, from, from itself you have a residue of powder or you have a residue of liquid which can then be rushed back to the laboratories stateside and you initiate your identification procedures. There's a third method for distributing a biological aerosol and it's referred to as a secondary aerosol. It's where you prepare a dry powder and you place the powder on a roadway or a sidewalk and people walking across the ribbon of powder or a vehicle traveling across the powder represents sufficient energy so that the particles are then released into the atmosphere at a height of maybe five to ten feet. Now, you have to build this characteristic into the powder. You simply don't dry an agent and expect it to have good secondary aerosol properties. You have to build that characteristic into it. Most people believe that following a biological warfare attack by aerosol, that secondary aerosols will be a real problem, and this is not the case at all. If you look at the physics of the aerosol itself, your big particles are going to fall out during cloud equilibrium. That is, the big particles are dropping 
out of the aerosol, falling onto rain, and adhesive forces between these particles and the ground are such that it's very, very difficult to create a secondary aerosol. Now, following cloud equilibrium, where you have your one to five micron particle size now in aerosol, this material is now behaving as a gas. It means that you get infected because you're a pump, literally a pump, and you're sucking in these particles as the aerosol passes you. Uh, contamination of clothing is not particularly important uh, as this aerosol passes over you. These particles behave truly as a gas. They tend to go around you as, a, as opposed to impinging on your clothes, although hair and beards do represent the uh, types of material that will collect the particles as they pass around you or through you. Well, we've talked about how a terrorist might get these weapons and how they're disseminated, but I think I'm still not clear on how he might actually use them. Well, Doris, uh, let me give you an example here. I think we have an advertisement uh, for a very legitimate peacetime device uh, known as the Ag Pilatus Porter. And this device uh, is a commercial crop dusting device meant to be strapped to the wing of your Cessna aircraft used to dust your crops. Um, it just so happens that this device is able to generate an aerosol particle size of one to five microns in diameter. And to show you why that's important, I think we have a film clip here uh, that'll demonstrate that uh, very well. If you have particles uh, that are bigger than five microns in diameter, uh, many of those particles, once they're released, tend to settle out very quickly uh, in the environment and never make it uh, to your respiratory tract. Those that you do breathe in get stuck in your nasal mucus and uh, never make it down to your lungs. On the other hand, particles uh, much smaller than one micron in diameter are readily inhaled, uh, but are just as readily exhaled, and very few of them uh, remain entrapped uh, uh, in the pulmonary tissues. Particles, though, of one to five microns in diameter are perfect for settling out uh, into the human lower respiratory tract. So when those particles are breathed in, uh, most of them do impinge on lung surfaces uh, and stay there. So the Goldilocks analogy, uh, some are too big, some are too small, and some are just right. Uh, and that pretty much, uh, this Ag Pilatus Porter device is a great d dissemination device for anthrax spores. Well, what about what Mr. Patrick mentioned about the right meteorological conditions? Well, those are clearly very important as well. Uh, and in fact, in a lot of terrorist attempts to use biological warfare, that's one thing the terrorists neglect, is they didn't get the meteorology what right. Um, I think we have another film clip that will demonstrate how important meteorology uh, and weather conditions are. If you were, for example, uh, to release uh, an agent uh, during the daytime, uh, much of this agent just drifts up into the atmosphere, doesn't settle out low over the terrain. However, as the sun goes down, an inversion condition uh, presents itself, uh, and this allows the agent to uh, spread itself over the terrain. As the sun comes up in the morning, uh, the inversion condition reverses itself, uh, and again, particulate matter, aerosol clouds, tend to uh, go up in the air, as, as you saw in the film clip there. Okay, then basically, from what we've seen, it seems the most effective use of a biological weapon is through inhalation. Well, yes, it is. I think this discussion is leading right to that conclusion that the inhalation route and aerosol delivery is the one that's going to be associated with the massive number of casualties. On the, on the modern battlefield, it would be just too difficult for an aggressor to, uh, uh, say, contaminate our water supply, our food supply, in sufficient quantity to cause mass numbers of casualties. Yeah, and, and just think about uh, Fourth of July on the Mall in Washington with all those thousands of people. Mm. If, if such a dissemination occurred, just, just think of the casualties. That's right. The, the, you know, the aerosol route, Doris, certainly uh, is, is, is the preeminent route by which we would expect a biological weapon to be delivered. But the oral route of exposure um, is somewhat important uh, uh, as well. Uh, certainly a terrorist could achieve his aims to a more limited degree uh, with an oral weapon. And uh, the example of the Rajneeshis, the cult out in Antelope, Oregon, uh, back in 1984, where they poisoned the salad bars at six restaurants in the Dallas, Oregon, um, uh, would be an example of that. Uh, the dermal route uh, of exposure uh, is also uh, a potential delivery route. Um, most of the agents that we're talking about in this course today are not dermally active, and in that context, a simple face mask or, um, or a gas mask would protect you when the mop gear that you would use for chemical warfare wouldn't be necessary. Uh, but there is an exception. One of the toxins uh, is dermally active. And then related to this uh, is this whole issue of percutaneous warfare. 
Uh, and there's a very famous example concerning a Bulgarian dissident named Georgi Markov. And in 1978, Markov, who was an escapee from communist Bulgaria, was standing at a bus stop uh, on a London street corner and was assassinated using a spring-loaded Maxwell Smart type umbrella that fired this rice and laced pellet uh, into his calf. Uh, on a onesie and twosie kind of scenario, you're trying to assassinate one person, very viable weapon. On a larger battlefield uh, scale, probably not a very efficient way of waging warfare or terrorism. Okay, so it's important to know what routes are possible and how the agents might most likely be disseminated. That's right, Doris, and this brings us to a very important point. The public health implications of these biological agents are crucial to understanding uh, and to helping determine uh, that an incident, in fact, has taken place in the first place. Uh, and then furthermore, what to do to stop the spread of disease once an incident has taken place. All right. Well, before we get into that, I would like to thank Colonel Parker and Mr. Blitz for being with us today. And if you have any questions for either of them, please go right ahead and fax them in, and we will answer them a little later in the program. And I think uh, we should now watch an interview with two public health professionals who were involved in a bioterrorist event who never thought they would be. On the 17th of September, 1984, um, folks at the health department in the Dallas, Oregon, received calls from uh, people who thought they might have uh, become ill after eating a restaurant in the town. Over the next couple of days, uh, about 20 calls came in of people saying, look, I got gastroenteritis after eating at uh, a couple of different restaurants in the Dalles. Um, cases started to decline in number, but then the, the next week there was a sudden increase in uh, phone calls. The local health department contacted the state, the state got involved, and um, on the 25th of September they asked CDC to participate in the investigation when it seemed as though there was an increase in the number of cases and they were unsure of how large the epidemic was likely to be. First, we, we learned that, uh, of course, there were many people who were becoming ill at the same time, and uh, that was of great concern, and it was sort of puzzling to us because it, it implied a common source outbreak. And we knew that in, in a community of about 10,000 people, we, we certainly wouldn't expect to see dozens and dozens of people coming forward all at the same time with uh, a common source. And so the uh, the challenge immediately was to try to find a common source. There were lots of interviews and uh, there were, was lots of um, field work done in the, in the restaurants in the area. There were 38 restaurants in the Dalles at the time and <clears throat> all of them were looked at. Um, they looked, of course, for things like uh, lots of lettuce or some other common ingredient to the salad bars which seemed to be implicated that might be a common source that could readily explain this. We were afraid that we had some sort of interstate shipment of something that all of the restaurants had in common and uh, that turned up negative and that was extremely puzzling because usually you can find a common source to something like this. Uh, as, as it escalated, uh, at one point somebody suggested the possibility that it had been an intentional contamination of the salad bars. But frankly that seemed pretty far-fetched to us. You know, they say when you hear hoofbeats, you're supposed to think of horses, not zebras. And uh, there had never been any report of an intentional contamination like this in the U.S. And uh, nobody was stepping forward and uh, claiming credit. Uh, nobody seemed to have any motive. It's just all of a sudden there were all these people getting Salmonella typhimurium. It looked like a common source, and uh, nobody could come up with a plausible explanation for it. There was no single answer or very simple answer to explain this outbreak. And in retrospect, I think that, what, that would be the kind of finding that would cause us to put the possibility of intentional contamination very high up on the list. Um, but on the other hand, if someone had stopped after a single restaurant, they could have made hundreds of people ill, but then that would have looked for all intents and purposes like any other foodborne outbreak. The agent that they chose um, was Salmonella typhimurium. Generally that's the most common or the second most common type of Salmonella that's identified in people every year in the United States. But it was unusual to see that many cases in a little community like the Dalles. Uh, up to the first eight months of 1984, they had reported no uh, salmonella isolates in the entire county for that time, and they typically averaged less than five a year. So 
the fact that we were starting to see a cluster of them was of interest to us. Uh, later, when we were able to characterize the isolate, at, really at the end of the outbreak, <coughs> we learned that it did have some unique characteristics which made it, uh, in fact, easier for us to track and, and determine the source and the relatedness of the different Salmonella typhimuriums that we were getting. Uh, this particular strain was mm -hmm. dulcetol negative, which means that it uh, fails to ferment a, per a particular sugar in the biochemical tests that we do. And that's very uncommon. Uh, only about 2% of the non-typhoid salmonellas uh, have that characteristic. And it also had an antibiotic um, susceptibility pattern that uh, made it different from most of the ones that were circulating at the time because it was sort of pre-antibiotic. Once we found out later in the investigation where the culture came from that they used for the outbreak, we understood why, because this had been collected by the American Type Culture Collection before the, the use of a lot of antibiotics in humans uh, many years ago. There were really a couple of phases to this event. The first one was the epidemiologic investigation and the control of the outbreak. And before that was over, we had uh, spent thousands of person hours and we had uh, cultured thousands of people and we had identified uh, over 750 cases of Salmonella typhimurium. We got it under control, and uh, at this point, the, the police, uh, various police agencies, the state police, the FBI, the Attorney General's office, uh, the organized crime unit, in fact, from the state of Oregon, the local law enforcement folks, a number of different uh, agencies were looking at the activities of the cult, of the Rajneeshis. At the time, all the law enforcement agencies uh, were investigating them for a number of different criminal acts. And in fact, if we had known what the law enforcement agencies knew, we would have been a lot more suspicious. Uh, we were public health types, innocents, and uh, the law enforcement people already knew that these folks were attempting murder. They had uh, tried to, to torch the uh, office of the land use planning folks in Wasco County. Uh, they had brought in homeless people from around the United States to get them registered to vote. Um, they had done a number of other things inside the commune, like wiretapping. Uh, the hotel at the commune had bugs in it all over the place. Uh, they were already being investigated for a lot of things. And so uh, the police almost immediately believed uh, that they had been involved with this contamination event. In fact, the local people uh, around the area suspected the Rajneeshis of being involved or responsible for almost anything bad that happened. And so, of course, they, they were suspected in this case. And uh, I have to say that personally, I thought that they were sort of, the Rajneeshis were sort of being picked on, that uh, they were probably just a bunch of folks trying to mind their own business who didn't fit in well in central Oregon. And so um, I, even though I had been to the commune, had uh, seen what was going on out there, and uh, had been involved with this police action, I came out thinking uh, that it probably was too far-fetched. I had been asked by the FBI and the Attorney General and the state police to go to the Pythagoras Medical Clinic, which was part of the Rajneesh Medical Corporation, and to go to their clinical laboratory and uh, look for anything that looks suspicious to me as a microbiologist, anything that might have been used to grow salmonella or uh, if I found any salmonella to seize it as evidence. And so that's exactly what I did. I went into the laboratory. I looked at uh, the cultures that were growing in the incubators. Um, I looked at their stock cultures and control cultures. And uh, I looked in freezers and refrigerators. I talked to the medical technologist who worked there. And uh, then I found a set of control discs in, a little, in little vials. And one of them was a Salmonella typhimurium control disc. And we didn't know it at the time, but that uh, almost certainly was the source of the culture that they used to contaminate the salad bars. It was uh, dulcetol negative, and it was identical by restriction endonuclease cuts and plasmid typing and antibiogram to the outbreak strain. It's hard to imagine um, any other way that could have happened by coincidence. We never got exact information about how they did it, but uh, some of the informants uh, from the cult told the state police that they had grown the cultures and then uh, they were instructed to put them on uh, food in, the, in salad bars, uh, which they did. They put it, uh, the salmonella cultures in coffee creamer and dressing and directly onto foods in at least 10 different restaurants. And they also tried this in um, a grocery store as well. I think they put it on some vegetables in a grocery store. Then they also attempted to 
contaminate the city water supply. They uh, climbed up on a water tower and cut a screen that was protecting the water in there from contamination and dumped the stuff in, but it didn't work apparently because there were no cases that seemed to have come from that. One of the things that I was most impressed by in this entire investigation was the quality and type of response of the county health department in the small, the small health department. They processed the information quickly. They realized that they had a potential problem and they made the link to salad bars and they closed salad bars in the town. This is long before calling CDC. So they quickly assessed the situation. They introduced an effective intervention and probably stopped the outbreak. And they didn't need the feds to tell them what to do. Um, it's a, from that standpoint, it's a real public health success story. Well, Doris, pretty uh, scary story mm. there. Uh, fortunately, you know, it all turned out pretty well. The Rajneeshis didn't win the, the local election. Uh, 750 people got sick, but fortunately no one died. And I, I'm a little worried that if a more lethal agent had been used uh, in a similar scenario, the results may have been uh, considerably worse. But so good, good for that. Yeah. Well, to help us discuss these issues are some public health experts from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and from the Army. Dr. Brad Perkins is Chief of the Meningitis and Special Pathogens Branch at CDC. Colonel Pat Kelly is the Director of the new Department of Defense Global Emerging Infection Surveillance and Response Group, and he is responsible for the DOD assisting in monitoring disease outbreaks throughout the U.S. and the world. Welcome, gentlemen, and thank you for joining us. You know, I've recently had the chance to actually participate in an epidemiologic investigation out at uh, Fort Bliss, uh, Texas, and uh, one of the questions that came up was, could this have been intentional? And of course it wasn't. Uh, we went through the basics of an epidemiologic investigation, and I have a little bit of an understanding of how that's supposed to work, uh, but I'm not sure I really understand how to approach an outbreak that may be uh, sinister, uh, I guess, for, for lack of a better word. So, uh, Colonel Kelly, I wonder if you could maybe enlighten us a little bit uh, as to how you'd approach something like that. Well, Ted, the first challenge is recognizing that the outbreak is taking place in the first place. Uh, we heard in the uh, last clip about the Rajneesh outbreak, which involved 700 people, but outbreaks may be considerably smaller. They may be experimental in preparation for larger events. Uh, so the, the first challenge is really recognizing that the outbreak is taking place. We heard earlier that one uh, advantage to a terrorist is the incubation period associated with uh, bioterrorist exposures, and that may allow the terrorist to get away. Well, similarly, it may allow the affected individuals to disperse over a wide geographic area uh, before they manifest illness, and that may make it difficult to detect, because unlike a nuclear or chemical event where you see a large number of casualties right in a small confined area. Here you might have cases spread out over many counties, even many states, and thus an individual clinician or even an individual hospital may not very promptly appreciate what is going on. So the initial uh, challenge with investigating these is recognizing that they take place. And there are a lot of lessons to be learned from the Oregon uh, outbreak. Uh, the importance of the public health laboratory and helping to pull together uh, a picture uh, across a whole community or a collection of communities. The importance of public health surveillance is key because again, a single clinician or a single hospital or maybe even a single public health department may not be able to see the whole picture and appreciates what is going on. And I think the first steps to evaluating outbreaks of, of this sort is to have a strong public health system of surveillance, including laboratory capabilities. And from that, you can develop the clues necessary uh, to start suspecting uh, these problems. Okay, well, Colonel Colley, for most of my career, I was a blue collar pediatrician uh, without any formal training, I guess, in epidemiology. Do I need special training to be able to work up one of these problems? Well, I think the role of pediatricians is primarily to be suspicious, and this course that uh, you're leading right now is a good start in helping to equip clinicians uh, to understand what 
uh, some of the manifestations could be of these events. Uh, and then uh, the next role is to contribute to the medical surveillance system. And the training necessary for that is not extensive or elaborate, uh, but in many cases it's learning what your health department currently requires of you and, uh, and following those requirements. Okay. Dr. Perkins, let me ask you, uh, is there some kind of surveillance system used to detect outbreaks and what triggers it? Yes, Doris. There's a U.S. surveillance system to report many of the diseases that we'll be talking about over the next three days. Those diseases are reported to state health departments and from there on to CDC. As far as triggers go, for some diseases like inhalation anthrax, the notification of even a single case will trigger a prompt public health investigation. Other diseases like salmonellosis, like you heard from Dr. Torek, uh, it may be a, the reporting of a larger number of diseases than what would be expected when compared to background that triggers uh, a public health investigation. One of the major concerns we have right now in the public health community is that the contemporary clinical, laboratory, and public health expertise for many of the high priority bioterrorism agents is, is ranges from non-existent to minimal, primarily because these have been rare, naturally occurring public health problems in the United States. But to detect possible instances of bioterrorism in the United States, we must develop a system where clinicians recognize these diseases, where laboratories have the capacity to confirm suspected diagnoses, and where the public health system is prepared to respond immediately with investigation and implementation of control measures. Well, so again, as a blue-collar pediatrician, I, I think if I saw a case of bizarro bacterium infection or something else that's in your book, I'd know enough or my hospital laboratory would know enough to report that. What about the case, though, that I, I just can't figure out, some weird disease and I'm not sure what's going on? What do I do about that case? That's an excellent point, Ted. Unfortunately, there's no formal means that currently exist within the public health system to report such cases although there frequently is informal communication about such situations. This is a recognized deficiency of our current uh, system to detect possible, possible instances of bioterrorism. Um, there are some ongoing efforts to try to address that deficiency, however. One example is a project that's ongoing in several parts of the United States right now to do surveillance for unexplained deaths and critical illnesses among previously healthy people. This is being done within the context of CDC's emerging infections programs. Projects like this and, and others we hope will give us a basis to, to fill some of these gaps on, on a more national level. Similarly, the Department of Defense has a new uh, emerging infections program that in many ways parallels the national effort defined by the CDC. Uh, we've been uh, trying to improve our public health laboratory capacity, uh, trying to improve reporting of laboratory confirmed conditions. Uh, we're also instituting mortality uh, surveillance for unexplained uh, causes of death and instituting surveillance in intensive care units for uh, serious unexplained conditions. I think what we really need to do, uh, the foundation of this to a great extent, is building communications networks because it's going to be hard to put in uh, hardwired systems that anticipate every possible manifestation and thus we need flexibility and we need to have very open lines of communication between clinicians and public health authorities including the state health departments and the CDC and those military people who can uh, help uh, out also. Okay, so what we're saying then is if you're not constantly looking out for some abnormal disease patterns, then you may miss a biological attack. That's exactly right, Doris. Physicians, nurses, laboratory sci and scientists need to stay in contact with their local and state public health departments and communicate about these issues. Even though there is a formal surveillance system for many of these diseases in the United States, a, a, a large majority of outbreaks are detected, in fact, by astute clinicians and other healthcare professionals and brought to the attention of the public health community. 
I think I have a little better understanding of the clinician's role in this whole process. My brother Paul, though, is a public health officer with the Oregon State Health Department. How would a white-collar, chairborne ranger, uh, public health officer like him, what would his role be uh, in this whole system? I think system? there's sibling <laughs> rivalry going on. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, the public health practitioner has a central role in this process. Um, as was alluded to by some of the previous speakers, the first responders uh, really in a, in a biological terrorist event uh, are from the public health community. And there are many systems that are uh, significantly underdeveloped that the development of which serves not only traditional emerging infections, but also bioterrorist events. Because really bioterrorist events are uh, unnaturally occurring emerging infections. And the surveillance systems that we need for more traditional emerging infections uh, are of the same nature as those that we need to recognize bioterrorist uh, events. Uh, I think we'll see a growing role for public health practitioners in developing new surveillance systems, uh, for example, uh, on real-time systems uh, looking at emergency rooms or uh, looking at uh, the use of certain types of antibiotic drugs. I know some cities in the country are now putting in surveillance systems of this nature and I think we will see more and more of those systems as we uh, are better able to uh, deal with this problem. Okay. Dr. Perkins, are there any easy clues that anyone can use that could tip them off that something unusual is going on? Yeah, there are some clues. Not very many of them are, are easy, and none of them take the place of a high-quality epidemiologic investigation. But certainly the occurrence of a disease in a population uh, where that disease does not normally occur or is not recognized to occur is a red flag that deserves prompt investigation. All right. Any examples? Well, uh, Ebola uh, infection outside of Africa, uh, Venezuelan equine encephalitis outside of Venezuela, or, or at least outside of Latin America. Mm -hmm. Those would be uh, a couple of examples, and okay. there are many others. Yeah, another example might be simultaneous outbreaks in a given population that might suggest the use of a bioterrorism cocktail, a, a weapon containing one, more than one etiologic agent. Uh, another clue, as, w as we've heard, uh, might be uh, data suggesting a large, massive point source outbreak. Okay, what kind of evidence? Well, some, something like what they saw uh, on the film in uh, the Dalles, Oregon. Uh, 700 uh, people getting, 750 people uh, getting ill within a very compressed uh, time frame. Uh, Brad may have other examples that he can mm -hmm. offer. No, I think uh, that that's an excellent one. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, there are... Uh, in, in, in the case of an aerosol exposure, uh, for example, uh, you might see illness limited to a fairly localized, uh, circumscribed geographic area. If you saw uh, disease localized to a very tight area, um, that might tip you off that there's been a local release of mm -hmm. something. Um, uh, low attack rates in personnel uh, who work in areas with filtered air supplies. Uh, if you work inside a building, the air is filtered in that building, you don't get sick, and everybody outside the building gets sick, that ought to there's tip you problem. off. There's a problem. And in fact, there's a military uh, correlate to that. If you're out on the battlefield and soldiers who are wearing their mop gear, wearing their protective masks, uh, don't get sick, and yet the soldiers who who aren't wearing their protective mm -hmm. gear uh, do get sick, that ought to tip you off that something has been aerosolized out there uh, mm -hmm. on the battlefield. All right. um, Any others? Well, uh, some of these diseases uh, produce, or some of these uh, agents, these weapon systems, uh, produce disease not only in humans, uh, but in animals as well. And I already mentioned the example of Venezuelan equine encephalitis. That's a disease that certainly can affect man, uh, but affects equine species as well. So if you're out there on the countryside and you see dead horses, dead mules, dead donkeys, uh, that ought to tip you off that, again, something uh, has been released uh, out there. And in fact, those animals can be used as sentinel animals. Um, Okay. What about large numbers of military and civilian casualties in a particular area? Right. Uh, biological warfare, biological terrorism is indiscriminate. Um, and uh, if you s were out uh, on the battlefield, for example, and a battlefield commander started to see uh, large numbers of casualties amongst his soldiers, if it were a biological agent producing those casualties, you would expect the civilian population that lived in that area uh, to be similarly affected. So. 
And of course, for a biological agent uh, that would be vector-borne in nature, its occurrence in an area where that uh, competent vector does not exist would be a, an indication. Okay, so Colonel Kelly, what's the take-home message? I think the take-home message is that all parts of the U.S. healthcare system have an important role to play here. The clinicians have to have an understanding of how these agents can possibly manifest themselves and uh, know who to bring their concerns to promptly. And then, of course, there's an important role for the public health practitioners in the United States in developing surveillance systems that are sensitive and timely so that we can jump on these uh, possible problems as soon as they arise.